Stephen Hawking is one of the greatest scientists of our day, and I remember reading about 10 years ago his book A Brief History of Time with great excitement, because here was the greatest scientist of our era explaining to me scientific principles in a way that I could pretty easily understand, and so I have a great appreciation and respect for the gifts that Stephen Hawking has given us when it comes to science. Now, Hawking has also recently made some theological statements that I think are worth exploring. He says things like, science is telling us that there is no room for the existence of God in the universe, that you don't have to look to God in order to explain the universe. He also says this in, uh, in an interview that came out a couple days ago in The Guardian. And I, I think this is interesting. He also says that the universe comes spontaneously by pure chance and that the universe came out of nothing. And I find this a very interesting statement to make because if I were to go on a walk with a scientist, for example, and the scientist pointed to a tree and said to me, Adam, where did that tree come from? And if I were to say, well, it just spontaneously came out of nothing. It just happens to come into being. I think the scientist would laugh at me. If somebody were to ask me, where did a brief history of time come from? And I were to say, it just came from nothing. It spontaneously arose and came into being. People would laugh at me. They would say, no, Stephen Hawking created a brief history of time. I would say, yeah, of course he did. Um, but for some reason, when we look back to the origin of the universe, this argument holds some weight, and I don't understand why. There's a philosophical tradition that says nothing can't produce something. In other words, something doesn't come from nothing. And so Christian philosophers have looked back to the origins of the universe and said, well, something must have caused something. Something must have caused creation, and that principle is God, we end up saying. Now, this may not work for you, or it may work well for you, but you still have to make the argument that nothing can produce something, which to me is pretty untenable to make. Hawking also says in this interview on heaven, the interviewer asks, well, we find ourselves here, what should we do? And Hawking ends up saying, we should seek the greatest value of our action. And I'm not exactly sure what he means by this. It sounds a lot like the philosophical tradition of Jeremy Bentham's utilitarianism. And utilitarianism ends up saying that we should ethically do the thing that causes the great, greatest amount of value or good to the greatest amount of people. And that sounds like a good idea. But other philosophers, such as Jeremy Stangroom, end up saying things like, this could lead us to what we at Raven would call scapegoating. If the greatest amount of good that a certain people feel comes from torturing an innocent person, utilitarianism could easily justify torturing someone if it causes a greater amount of people a feeling of good and happiness. So there's a danger in... I think there's a danger in what Stephen Hawking is saying here. Also, uh, the final point is his ideas about heaven. And what he ends up saying uh, that I want to critique and something that I want, that I appreciate, uh, he ends up saying that the human brain is as a machine. And after a machine dies, it doesn't go anywhere. It just is there. There's no heaven for a machine. And I want to caution us against talking about the human brain as a machine. There's something very cold about that and something very almost unhuman about that. The human brain is not as a machine. The human brain has emotions and feelings and it's not objective. You can't, it doesn't make objective calculations. It's very subjective. So I want to steer away of using language that compares the brain to a machine. Um, what he does say that I appreciate, though, is that heaven, for many people, is a fairy story. And I actually appreciate what he's saying here, because many Christians, for example, want to treat heaven 
as this place of great individual joy for a person. We go to heaven and it's all about me. And I, that's, that's a fairy story that is not true in, when it comes to heaven, the Christian understanding of heaven. Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is among you. Jesus brings about this kingdom of heaven. And what does the kingdom of heaven look like for Jesus? Well, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That cryptic saying is pretty much saying that it's not about you receiving uh, great honor when it comes to heaven. Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is a way of life where you care for the poor. You care for those that utilitarianism might scapegoat. You care for those who are on the fringes of society. You give healing to the sick. You give water to those who are thirsty. You feed the hungry. This is what heaven is all about. And I don't think that there's going to be a big difference between the way that Jesus taught the kingdom of heaven here on earth and the way that the kingdom of heaven when the new heaven and the earth, new earth come together. I don't think there's a big difference between those two views of heaven. So those are my thoughts on Stephen Hawking and um, I would love to hear what you think. Thanks.